I'm Conley Weinbarger, Vice President and Chief Academic Officer for the college, and certainly my pleasure to welcome each of you here to uh, this February uh, speaker event in our SciTech series. We're certainly pleased to have Dr. Hill with us today. Uh, you, will, you will enjoy hearing from him. Our SciTech series began uh, two or three years ago to highlight science, technology, and, and innovation, and the intersection of those disciplines. And uh, so we've had over 1,700 folks come to hear those over the last couple of years. Uh, so we hope you continue to come and, and visit and to hear our, our speakers. Uh, that series doesn't uh, just happen. Uh, so we have a SciTech team that uh, does a lot of work behind the scenes to make it all happen, and some of them are probably out front, but I know a lot of them are here. So would you please stand and let us recognize you, and thank you for all of your, your hard work. We appreciate that. Thank, thank you. So without, without further ado, I want to ask Karen Hicks, Vice President, uh, for human resources at Targaset to come forward and, and introduce our speaker. Karen? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hope you've had an opportunity to read Dr. Hill's bio that was in your folder. And what I want to do is take a non-traditional approach to his introduction. I told him today he might want to be a little bit afraid. Um, so but I'd like, to, <laughs> I'd like to take you on a three-minute, not-so-imaginary journey. So assume it's the second half of calendar year 2012, and you're a recruiter with an executive search firm who has been retained by a Winston-Salem biotech company publicly traded to identify a successful candidate for the position of president and CEO. So to put it in context, here's a snapshot of the company at that time. The company's lead drug candidate has recently failed in phase three clinical trials, and the company's major collaboration with a notable large pharmaceutical company has been terminated. The company is shutting down its on-site laboratory operations and going through a second workforce reduction that will reduce the company to 40 employees from approximately 140 a year earlier. The company's clinical pipeline includes three Phase 2B programs, two of which are high-risk CNS-focused. The company also has a substantial library of preclinical compounds. The company has an accumulated deficit of $218 million since its inception in 1997. There are no FDA-approved products on the market and minimal ongoing revenues. The share price of the company's stock has tumbled from a 52-week high of north of $22 a share and now trades at less than $5 a share. While the company has in excess of $180 million of cash and investments, the market capitalization of the company is below that level, which suggests maybe some skepticism in the investment community about the ability of the company to be successful and create meaningful value going forward. The standards for approval of CNS products or product candidates through regulatory processes and patient safety are daunting at best. Retention of employee talent is a significant concern, although numerous seasoned industry staff members are still with the company. The patent clock is running for intellectual property exclusivity periods but the company has an impressive and extensive patent estate. 
The company has a good investor base and a very supportive board of directors. And out of the universe of biotech companies that were started around the same time as this company, this one is still one of the few that is alive and moving forward. So given that you're a recruiter, your question is, what are the experiences, talents, and attributes that you want to target when you are in the process of identifying this successful candidate? So maybe you'd want to consider these. Someone who understands the biotech industry and recognizes the inherent risk of failures that are inevitable with drug development, but also recognizes the opportunity to positively impact patient lives and create substantial value with success. A senior executive whose main goal is not to sell the company, but rather to lead the company's progression towards a sustainable, profitable business. Someone who is committed to building the company's successes over the past years and has the vision and enthusiasm to continue moving its drug candidates toward commercialization. An executive who has a high risk tolerance, but is measured in decision making, negotiating, managing capital efficiently, determining appropriate staff levels, and assessing a portfolio of product possibilities. An individual who has an exceptional ability to motivate employees in the face of expected obstacles and setbacks while appropriately modulating over optimism. An executive who has a proven track record of success with talent and leadership development of staff. A person who is committed to a biotech presence in the North Carolina Piedmont Triad region and is willing and interesting, interested in establishing a residency in Winston-Salem. An individual who places a high value on honest, straightforward communications with all company stakeholders. A leader who demonstrates strong corporate citizenship to the communities in which he lives and works. An executive who has the ability to quickly appreciate that there is something significant and unique about this biotech company which has been resilient with successes and setbacks and remained viable and driven by strong science for over 10 years. And perhaps most importantly, an individual who has a positive restlessness and the tenacity to bring much needed medicines to patients. After all, that's why biotech and pharma companies are in business. It's all about the patients. Of course, by now you figured out the company I'm talking about is Targacept. And the executive I've just described is Dr. Steve Hill. So it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce him. Steve. Thank you so much. So um, I don't quite know how to respond to that other than you know, thanks for uh, you know, several minutes of a discussion of, uh, of failures. Um, my job as the new CEO, having been here for just over a year now, is to, uh, is to inform you that we continue down that track of failures. Uh, but, you know, but that is the story of biotech. Um, and as you'll see as I go through the presentation, um, the one thing you cannot do in biotech is give up. Because uh, any company that gave up based on failures, given the stage that we've got to as a company at Targacept, um, if if companies gave up at that stage, there would be no successful biotech companies. And as you see as we get towards the end of the presentation, the value of successful biotech companies is enormous. So let me start off with this slide. Uh, how many people in the audience have seen this slide ever before? One. That's good, because if you've seen it before, then you can leave because you've seen all the rest of them before as well. Or you can take it like a Shakespearean play and say every time you see it, it gets better. So. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is just basically ask you, I, I, I can talk about any of these things. I, mean, I can talk about anything. So whether it'll be interesting or not, I don't know. But um, so maybe somebody can just choose one of these things and we'll, we'll use that as a starting point and, uh, and we'll, we'll structure the talk around that. So I, anybody who feels you know, that they want to shout out, just, just pick one of these things and, and we'll see where we go with it. Bugs. Bugs. Okay. Now, I, 
I wish I could remember them, but uh, I mean, th this is the one bit I do have to read because these are in no particular order. Um, let me just get the right thing to, is that the, yeah, here we go. So, so this is the bug stuff up here, and I don't know which is which, but maybe somebody's, uh, somebody can tell me. But these are the green June beetle larva, the southern mole cricket, a flea beetle, a vegetable weevil, white fringe beetle, and suck flies. Uh, and there's a special prize for anybody. There's, there's lots of little prize. Well, actually, there's no prizes at all, but there's a little competition as we go through. But anybody have any idea what they have in common, those bugs? No? Well, they're all pests that attack tobacco plants. And if you think about it, um, you know, tobacco, the like it or not, is a huge um, economic value to this region. Uh, and so the fact that there are all these natural pests of the tobacco plant is a real problem. Um, now, it turns out that tobacco has a built-in pesticide. Okay? Um, so the tobacco leaf is resistant to some extent to these pests because it contains nicotine. So when you ask the question, as we think about it, we go through the purpose of target set, which is a company that's built around understanding the role of nicotine, then nicotine exists in biology uh, as a means by which tobacco protects itself from damage from these pests. So we're going to get a little bit in that as we go through this. Here's some more uh, chemicals. Um, I, I caution any of you, if you're putting together a talk like this, to be careful uh, what you type into the internet. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're looking for a picture for embalming fluid, this is about the only one that I found that I could possibly show in public. So. Um, but th so this is embalming fluid. This looks, for all the world, like uh, a nice bottle of Patron. It's actually arsenic. Um, so it's, uh, it's the poison arsenic. This is supposed to reflect uh, benzene and carbon monoxide. Uh, the main constituent of lighter fluid is butane. Um, batteries, where would we be ba without batteries? I mean, how, how would we run our lives without batteries? So one of the key components of batteries is cadmium. cadmium. Uh, a heavy metal. Cyanide, uh, pretty dangerous, but it's actually very valuable in extracting precious metals like gold and silver. Uh, you know, probably everybody's got some of this in the house for, for killing the bugs. This contains DDT, so it's a pesticide that's very helpful uh, in certain circumstances, but detrimental in other circumstances. So um, the, the key thing about all of this, and, th and this is a, uh, a photograph from the site of Bofal which was uh, the site of one of the biggest industrial disasters in history, um, where may many people were damaged and killed by uh, the leakage of a toxic chemical. So th the point I want to make about this slide is, if you just take cadmium, for example, cadmium is poisonous in the wrong circumstances, but it's very ben beneficial in making batteries. So like every chemical, there are benefits to most chemicals, but there are downsides to most chemicals. Uh, and, and this is a selection of some pretty nasty, poisonous chemicals. Now, having said all of that, uh, there is one place that you can get access to all of these at the same time for personal ingestion legally. Anybody have any idea? It's all in there. So. I mean, this is not a presentation about the tobacco industry, but it does raise the question, if you go back to this, I mean, everybody knows in this day and age that cigarette smoke contains some pretty toxic substances. So why on earth would anybody smoke cigarettes? And, and I'm not here to promote this. I've never smoked cigarettes. I think it's the single worst healthcare thing that you can do. And therefore, stopping people smoking is probably the single most cost-effective healthcare intervention. I say that in Winston-Salem. I apologize. <laughs> but, it's, but it's the reality. But there is something within the epidemiology of smoking which is intriguing. And that is schizophrenics seem to become very heavy smokers for some reason. So people who develop schizophrenia typically become heavy smokers because it seems to make their symptoms better. People who are long-life smokers seem to be less likely to develop Parkinson's disease. So there's something seemingly protective about smoking when it comes to Parkinson's disease. Uh, my father-in-law had pretty severe ulcerative colitis, and he was a smoker. And every time he tried to stop smoking, his ulcerative colitis would flare up. So there was something protective in the smoking that helped his GI bowel disease. 
So I guess the message is there's something going on. So whilst the overall effect of smoking is detrimental because of many of those toxins that I've showed you, there's something in there that seems in some certain specific circumstances to be beneficial. So how do we understand that? And I like to use this analogy. Uh, in my condo where I live, um, when I first got there, I, I couldn't understand how the post office, the postman who came and put the stuff in the post box would get through it you know, without spending all day there. And of course, then I realized that he had a master key uh, which opened the whole thing up and he could just slot the stuff into the various little things. Uh, so this is, if you like, a, a, a lock box where each of these is an individual's uh, post, office uh, post office box, if you like, but there's a master key that opens the whole thing. And if you think about that from the point of view of smoking as an analogy, Smoking is a little bit like opening up this whole thing. So what you're doing is you're opening up this big box, you're getting access to the benzene, the carbon monoxide, the butane, the arsenic, uh, the cyanide, and the whole lot. And that's problematic, and it's certainly not very helpful if we want to think about how might we harness somehow that little bit of the cigarette, the, the tobacco plant that may be beneficial. Uh, and there is one bit which I didn't highlight, but maybe I'll go back a couple of slides in here is this, which is, here's another component of tobacco, which is, this is a nicotine patch, which has been used um, to help people kick the habit of smoking. So this is the one uh, medicinal product in here, which seemingly has had some benefit uh, in helping some patients. So if you go back to this lockbox analogy, what if there was some way of saying, okay, maybe we can somehow just open this particular box, and leave all the rest of these shut. And a lot of what we do in the biopharmaceutical business is about trying to navigate into a big sea of different chemical and biological activities and find the specific area where we can get the benefit of an, a biologically active agent without the detrimental effects of it. So what about the nicotine? And, and nic nicotine, as I started the, the talk with the idea of nicotine, nicotine exists in the tobacco plant and other plants as a natural pesticide. So it has a natural biological activity. Um, and it's pretty ubiquitous across plants, animals, and all species. Um, so that suggests that it's pretty important. If you like, and the way we like to talk about this in Targacept is that nicotine seems to act as a volume control. Um, so without getting too scientific, um, this is a, a very simplistic cartoon of a, uh, two nerves connecting with each other. And if you imagine one nerve uh, coming up against another nerve, the impulses that go down a nerve are electrical. So those electrical impulses then need to get passed on to the next nerve along, if you like, but there's a gap there. So that gap is too big for the electrical impulse to jump across. So what happens, and that's called a synapse, so that gap between the end of one nerve and the beginning of another nerve is called a synapse, and that gap, the transmission of the electrical impulse from here to here is mediated via chemicals. So, impulse comes along here, these chemicals are released, they act on these receptors, and they trigger an impulse in this next nerve down. So these are called neurotransmitters that are released by one end of the nerve, go across this gap, act on these receptors, and trigger a response in this nerve. If you like, the sensitivity of those receptors can be changed by nicotine. So nicotine can modulate these receptors and change the strength of the signal that's going down this neuron. And that's really, so, so we talk about it a little bit as the, the volume knob for neurotransmitters, of which acetylcholine particularly is very important. Um, so what we're trying to understand is, can we, knowing from all this epidemiology that nicotine seems to be beneficial in some diseases, can we somehow understand how to canvas or harness uh, the benefits of nicotine as a medicine? So the problem with that to start with, though, is the same problem with every chemical. So nicotine, as a chemical, has positive benefits and negative benefits. And if you think about those um, in terms of thinking about a, uh, somebody who's smoking, for example, uh, and I never quite realized this, but if you, if you watch somebody smoking, sometimes people will smoke and, and take lots of little short drags of the cigarette. And in low doses, which is what you get when you take those short intakes of the cigarette, is a stimulant. Whereas in contrast, in higher doses, so if you watch somebody just going, taking a big deep breath, then 
it's a relaxant. So nicotine can have opposing effects depending on the dose. So in low doses, it acts as a stimulant. And in high doses, it acts as a relaxant. So as we think about making drugs, we have to take that into consideration. And what I've shown you is a very simplistic cartoon about neurotransmission, but those synapses, there are billions of those in our body. There are billions of transmissions going on all the time. So some of those can modulate good things, some can modulate bad things. So if you think about changes in neurotransmission, if we just do that, uh, I would say randomly, but without care, then we can affect a lot of different things. For example, brain activity. So, and that can be a good thing sometimes. So we may be able to help depressed people get undepressed. Uh, we may be able to improve memory. We may be able to improve sleep. But equally, if we get it wrong, we could do the opposite of those things. Um, Nicotine affects and neurotransmitters affect GIGU signaling, for example, the bladder. So how often the bladder contracts and how strongly the bladder contracts is modulated by neurotransmitters, which can be changed by levels of nicotine. GI tract motility, so our gut, whether it's the upper GI tract or the lower GI tract, seems to be modulated by, certainly modulated by neurotransmitters, and may be modified by nicotine activity. Cardiovascular system, so blood pressure. Um, Targacept in its early days had a drug for high blood pressure, which worked via nicotinic channel modulation. So we can have an impact on blood pressure, in this case to lower blood pressure. But again, if we get it wrong, then we might have detrimental effects on blood pressure. Um, muscles and joints are modulated by neurotransmitters. So again, you can see that there's almost nothing here in the human body which might not be affected by modulating neurotransmission. So we have to think carefully about how might we do that beneficially so we can get the benefits without the detriment. And one of the biggest detriments of modulating uh, these pathways is dry mouth. And so some of the drugs that are on the market today that affect acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter have a terrible problem with dry mouth. So for example, many of the drugs that are used today for overactive bladder uh, are very difficult for the patients to continue taking because they cause such severe dry mouth that the patients end up coming off the drug because of that side effect. So we know that, that nicotine has biological activity, but it's relatively nonspecific so it can, in principle, affect many of those different things that I showed you there. And the effect it has is relatively modest. So that's why if you look at schizophrenics, for example, they are very heavy smokers. They'll get through several packs a day because the level of benefit they're getting from the cigarettes is, is really relatively small. And they have to dose themselves very highly to get any of that benefit. So really, Targacept has been built around trying to understand this a little bit better and trying to say, how can we understand... Uh, how nicotine is working, and maybe we can find different drugs that have some of the beneficial effects of nicotine without some of the side effects. So I'm going to use the same lockbox idea again, but imagine now we're just picking on the nicotine piece of this, but if you blow that out, that in itself can be considered as one big box, which you open the whole thing, it gives you some good effects on the brain, some bad effects on muscles, some indeterminate effects on, on blood pressure, maybe some dry mouth, and so on. So now, can we delve in even deeper and say, well, how do we pick on something that open, opens, only opens this little piece uh, of the whole thing, so that we can be really focused and find a very specific molecule that only acts on the particular receptor, which in this case that is beneficial in central nervous system disease. So with that, um, it almost goes back to the start again where Karen made the introduction, which is we live in an industry where almost everything fails. And that's, that's the reality of the business that we're in. Uh, why does it fail? Uh, and particularly in neuroscience, which is brain disease. I and mean, we still today do not understand the cause of most brain disease. We, we understand there are changes in different levels of neurotransmitters. But in terms of understanding what really causes schizophrenia, what really causes Alzheimer's, what really causes depression, we're still pretty much in the dark. So we can embark upon a hypothesis where we may choose a particular target. Uh, for example, many of you may know the story of uh, amyloid and Alzheimer's. When you look at patients who die of Alzheimer's, it seems they have high concentrations of amyloid in the brain. So billions of dollars have been spent by some of the cleverest companies on the planet to find drugs that moderate the levels of amyloid. To this date, 
nobody has found a drug that has any beneficial effect in Alzheimer's disease. And it may simply be that the observation of amyloid in Alzheimer's is just a random finding. It may not be part of the pathophysiology. It may not be part of the causative uh, reason behind Alzheimer's. So we could, we could identify a target and do everything else right. We can find the perfect compound against that target. We can run the clinical studies perfectly. Uh, we can spend $2 billion, and, uh, and it really is $2 billion, to run a program and do everything right except get a negative result because the original target was the wrong target. If we get the target right, often it's very difficult to find the right chemistry. And, and the way to think about this is a lock and key model. So receptors, if you like, are like a, a lock. And what we're trying to find is the very specific key that goes into that lock and opens that lock and only that lock. So if we get the target right, which is the lock, but we can never find the right key, or we find the master key that not only unlocks this particular target, but unlocks a dozen different other targets with all the side effects that go with that, then again, another cause of failure. We can have completely the wrong mechanisms. So we can find out it's nothing to do with the chemistry or the target. It's just the sequence of events that happens in whole human beings is not as we thought from our non-human experiments. And then of course, in clinical development, we may do everything right in terms of the, the preclinical work, the chemistry and the biology. We find some unexpected event in human beings. Uh, I, I would think probably it's right that 40 or 50% of clinical programs fail in the end because of unexpected side effects. And sometimes those failures are very late. Typically in a drug development program, you might study four or 5,000 patients. When you get into the marketplace, you're giving your drug to maybe millions of patients. So if you have a, an incidence of, think about this, maybe one in a million of sudden death, you are never gonna see that in a 5,000 patient clinical study. You're only gonna see that once the drug is on the market. And if your drug is on the market for a big prevalent disease like hypertension, and is gonna be given to 100 million people or 50 million people or even 20 million people, one in a million deaths, unexpectedly, is an unacceptable risk profile for a new medicine. So the risks we take in terms of understanding our drugs are very significant. It may simply not work in humans. We may never know why. And even when we get all of that right, the quality of manufacturing is a significant hurdle for many drugs. So to be, to be able to demonstrate you can manufacture your drug to the quality standards necessary to ensure uh, you've got exactly the right dosing, that you've got the right formulation, that you've got the drug in a stable form, uh, that can ultimately derail. So you've got to get all of this right, you've got to meet the needs of various different regulatory authorities around the world, uh, and then you've got to get your commercialization strategy right. So there are many, many places where this can go wrong. So, so <laughs> with all that, why do we bother? Why are we still here? Why haven't we given up? Uh, Target set's been around for probably 15 years. We do not yet have a success story in terms of a drug that looks like it's going to make it to market as a medicine. So why do we bother? And, and the answer to that uh, at this point in our uh, journey, if you like, is, is these three things. So, and I call, it, I call these disasters because I think as you'll see from the next few slides, they really are disasters. So we have a, what I call a disaster of epidemic proportions brewing. A second disaster which already exists on our streets and, and a third disaster hidden on our homes. And these are just three that we have been working on recently. Um, so let me, let me cover a few of those. This is where I, I've got a few more questions for you. So um, you can just shout. And maybe we'll go through them and see who recognizes who. There's an there's a extra special bonus point for one of these. But uh, anybody got any ideas who these are? Yeah, well, you know you've seen this before. You ought to know. So this guy. Anybody know? Just shout out. Charles Bronson. Uh, this one? Rita Hayworth. Colombo. Sugar Ray Robinson. Anybody doesn't know this? Ronald Reagan. Charlton Heston. There's a prize for this one. There's, there's negative marks if you get it wrong. Anybody know? Anybody know uh, what these guys have all got in common? Yeah, so this is, this is Dr. Alzheimer. So uh, he's the person who first described the disease. Uh, everybody on this, uh, on this picture suffered from Alzheimer's. Um, and I just want to get the numbers right for you, but uh, you probably all have been touched by this disease somehow because it is so prevalent um, that, that almost, almost every one of us 
I suspect, has either a family member or a friend who knows somebody who is suffering with this disease, and you know how devastating it can be. Uh, currently, about 5 million Americans, uh, of whom, and this was really brought home to me when, when we had a little company visit from Targacep down to one of the daycare homes here, uh, 500,000 of those people are under the age of 65. So this is not a disease only of old people. Uh, it can also be a devastating disease of people much younger. Um, and, and just imagine when you've lost your ability to really recognize people and, and know who's around you. So, I mean, it, it's a very troubling disease. Uh, probably costs the country $100 billion a year, uh, $600 billion worldwide. Uh, and it's estimated that one in 85 people, so I don't know how many people we've got in the room, but maybe uh, you know, one person in this room for sure is going to suffer from Alzheimer's on average um, by 2050. So that is a massive epidemic uh, which is already underway and is only going to get worse as the population ages and, and it's seemingly as the incidence of, of Alzheimer's uh, increases. Um, you know the symptomatology, so memory loss, confusion, apathy. Some of these folks get very aggressive as well, and that can be a very disturbing um, uh, problem. It's the li sixth leading cause of death uh, in the U.S., and there's one new case arising every 70 seconds. Um, and the three drugs that are currently available, or well, there's three or four drugs that are available, three of them are cholinesterase inhibitors, uh, and one works by a different mechanism, uh, the most recent introduction into this market uh, was 2003, so it's been 10 years since there's been a new drug launched for this condition. So there's a desperate need. Uh, this is one of the areas that we're working on. Uh, we think that nicotinic uh, modulation might be a way of, of, of influencing this. We know that acetylcholinesterase inhibitors work in this indication. Nicotine can modulate that. So this is an area where we think, and we have a study underway that will read out in the middle of this year, which I think is a very high hurdle. We've set ourselves a high hurdle, but if it works, it could be a meaningful difference uh, in this patient population. So that's Alzheimer's, one of the disasters in the making. Um, this, the, the title is a clue. Anybody know who these folks are? Who's the aging rockers in the room? This, this is a, a Nobel Prize winner. So this is John Nash, who is the uh, mathematician who is featured in The Beautiful Mind. Um, this is Lincoln's wife. This is Peter Green, who's a mu musician with Fleetwood Mac. And this is a famous musician from probably my favorite band of all time, Pink Floyd, which is Sid Barrett. So anybody know what they've got in common? They were, they were all schizophrenic, so they all suffer from schizophrenia. So this is the second disaster in the making, if you like. Um, there are three different sets of symptomatologies in this. There, there are ones that we, we all tend to be fairly familiar with, which is so-called positive symptoms. Positive symptoms in schizophrenia are where the patients suffer from hallucinations, uh, hearing voices, thinking that the TV is talking to them. Um, they can be very paranoid. Um, and, and sometimes, though mostly not, can be quite dangerous as a consequence of that paranoia. Uh, but also there is a different set of symptoms called negative symptoms where people get reserved, uh, they don't want to go out. It's almost like depressive type symptoms. They'll sit in a corner, sit at home, and they won't go out. They're not productive in society. Um, and then the third set of symptoms uh, is really the cognitive dysfunction. So uh, alongside those positive symptoms, negative symptoms, they also have this just inability to do basic tasks, inability to, to get out um, and, and, and go about the day-to-day -day activities of living. Um, today's drugs tend to be fairly good at treating the positive symptoms, but really not very good at treating the negative symptoms um, and the cognitive symptoms. So this is another area that we, we were working on until fairly recently. So last time I gave this talk, this was a, a great hope for us uh, as potentially a new medicine that would make a difference uh, in this patient population. That study read out in December of this year and was negative. Um, so we failed to demonstrate an efficacy or an effect uh, despite a couple of years and, and several million dollars running that study. Uh, that's life in our business. Um, we pick ourselves up and we move on to the next thing, which you'll hear about in a moment. Um, so again, that, that's something that I, I think Karen, as head of our HR group, has done a fantastic job of keeping the morale of the company together. And I think it's fair to say that we look around the place and, and people are motivated, enthusiastic, and we know we're in a high-risk business. This is not a business for people who are faint-hearted. So we know we're in a high-risk business. 
Um, it's probably true to say that most scientists in the biopharmaceutical business will never in their whole career work on a program that sees the light of day as an approved medicine. Imagine that. Imagine spending a whole career and never touching something that ends up in the hands of patients as a meaningful medicine. It's dedication to a cause because we simply don't know which of these programs are going to work and which are not. But if we all give up because of failures, then nobody will see any new medicines. So, next one. Uh, I don't have pictures. I'm not sure that uh, famous celebrities uh, particularly advertise when they have this particular condition. Um, and and th this is sort of almost deliberate, really, you know, to have a, a sort of joke in the middle. I called the incontinence hotline and they asked if I could hold. And the reason I put that up there, not because it's funny, but because people think it's funny. I and mean, there are certain diseases um, that people just tend to think is a bit amusing. But the reality is... Just imagine, if, if, if you're one of the patients who suffer badly from this, and, and you're suffering from maybe three or four incontinent episodes per day, which is the typical level of symptoms of the patients who enter into the studies that we do for this of, sort of, of disease. So that's three or four times a day, you are unable to get to the bathroom in time without having an accident. So this is not just a question of overactive bladder and going to the bathroom a few more times a day than you would like. It's a sense of urgency where most of us can control that and can get to the bathroom in time, but these folks can't. And so the consequence of that is that they don't go out. They don't go to the shopping mall. They don't go out socially because they're fearful that they're going to have an accident. So this is a huge medical problem. So this is what I call the disaster hidden in our homes. Um, and the numbers are really pretty daunting. So 13 million Americans, it's estimated, most of whom are female, but this affects men as well. Um, 20 to 30 percent of those people are young adults. This is not just a disease or a, a problem of, of older people. Um, people end up unemployed because of this, because they can't hold down a job because of these symptoms. Um, and current treatment is really pretty modest. So these folks typically will have 12 or 13 Episodes of going to the toilet or the bathroom each day. Today's treatments might reduce that by a half or one trip to the bathroom per day. They might reduce the incontinent episodes from three a day to two per day. That's still two per day. So by no means is there anything out there that will cure these patients. So there's a, a complete and serious unmet medical need, which again, we think that modulating nicotine receptors can have an impact on this. So... This is why we persist, if you like, because we have an idea that maybe one day we can allow Alzheimer's patients to remain independent for longer. We've not been able to make a, an impact on schizophrenics, but we now have to just redirect our resources to these other areas. We'd like to think that eventually, because of our medicines, patients with overactive bladder will be able to get back out into their social networks, back into the workplace, uh, and be productive members of society and happy members of society. And what does that mean for the community? Uh, we're proud to be you know, part of the community in Winston-Salem. Um, these are just a few of the biotech companies that we've looked at over the last few months as, a, as an executive team to ask the question, what is it that makes a successful biotech company? Um, and what does a successful biotech company look like? And, and I tell you, without going into too much detail of this, but if I just pick these companies who are, I think on average, um, I forget the number, but I think it's about 10 billion in market cap, average, 14 billion. So the average market capitalization of these companies is $14 billion. So the sum total of these one, two, three, four, five is in excess of maybe $60 billion in market cap. Um, and their revenue levels um, average $1.2 billion per company in revenues. And when we look back, as we all did, at where did these companies start from? What did they get right that maybe we've got wrong? And what you see when you read the history of these companies is exactly what we see when we read the history of Targetsept to date. The reality is they've been around maybe 10 years longer than we have. So we're at the point where most companies are after maybe 15 years. Typically, it takes $2 billion and 25 years to launch a single drug, if you look at the history of most biotech companies. So if you stop 
after 280 million in 15 years, you're probably never going to get there. And if you ask the question, what is it about these companies? Maybe I'll finish with that in, in a couple of slides time. What is it that made these companies successful compared to some of the companies that haven't? But I'll just keep that for just one moment. Um, because the other, the other comment I just wanted to make is that each of these companies typically went from an employment base of 100 to 150 people to 1,500 employees over about a six-year period. So when it became, And this is after 20 years of trying and failing. So all of these companies had their failures. All these companies went to the brink, went to the edge, but decided to continue. But once they got to the point where something started to work, over literally a, as short as a six-year period, they went from 100 people to 1,500 people as they prepared and went through the process of commercializing a drug. So there's a huge economic benefit for those communities in which these companies start and continue and ultimately are successful. So I guess this is how I'm going to finish up, which is uh, we'd like to see ourselves one day as part of this group of companies. Uh, I believe we're giving ourselves the best chance of being able to do that. Uh, and... My great friend, Eric Tomlinson, who's also, as you may know, from Great Britain, uh, when we both ended up here, completely accidentally as it happens, uh, we rechristened your town Winston Churchill. So, <laughs> so I have to finish with a quote from Winston Churchill. Uh, this is really one of our aspirations at Targacept, and it's definitely the common feature of all of those companies, which is perseverance. So this is, this is what I leave you with. If you're interested in biotech, this is probably the most important phrase you'll hear. Never give in, never give in, never, 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 never. And we have no intention of giving in. So thank you and very happy to answer any questions or attempt to answer any questions if you have some. Thank you. Questions? Don't be shy. As controversial as you like. Because I have somebody here who will answer the difficult ones. <laughs> so yeah, go on. You can, you can coordinate. Yeah. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, my question is, with the work that you do and the work that's going on downtown, what role does IT play in regards to the software that you use to collect data, and then is is that the the one of the big words now is uh, is big data mm -hmm. metadata? Is there what what is the potential for software in IT people? Well, the simplest answer to that question is we simply could not do our job without access to high-level IT? That, that's a simple answer to what is actually a very complicated question, but just, just ranging from the simplistic stuff of just connectivity. You know, we have 40 people who've got to be able to communicate with each other, uh, and, and we need all those typical tools that you would use uh, so we can access information, access people very easily. Uh, to ranging to the high end of uh, if you look at some of the uh, rational design, so looking at three-dimensional pictures of uh, receptors and trying to design chemistry that locks into that, so that lock and key um, idea, and, and trying to visualize what tiny receptors in the body look like and visualize the chemical structures of compounds that might bind accurately with those compounds. Um, you, you talk about big data, that's not really a thing for target set at the moment because our studies tend to be relatively small, maybe two, three hundred patients. But in terms of big data for the industry as a whole, it's crucial because then we can start looking at databases of hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of data points and try and tease out of that areas where we may have missed uh, some signals without that sort of set of tools. So I mean, we could talk about, we, we could have a whole day talking about the role of IT in, in biopharmaceuticals, but it's, it's business critical, without a doubt. Yeah. So the question is, do we have equal focus on those three diseases? Well, we, we did, um, but as I say, our schizophrenia program read out negative at the end of last year. 
So we really don't have any focus on that now. Uh, there is another company called Envivo and AbbVie, which was part of the Abbott organization, are both pursuing that similar type of program for schizophrenia. So the industry as a whole is still looking at that. Um, we felt that we needed to move on to something different. So we have our Alzheimer's program. Uh, we have uh, our overactive bladder program. We're just about to begin a program in gastroparesis, which is, if you imagine overactive bladder is, a, is a, like a bag that squeezes too much, gastroparesis is a different bag, your stomach, which doesn't squeeze enough. And that's a real problem for diabetic patients. Uh, so we're just about to start a program in that area. And we're looking at a whole range of, of different opportunities that we think may be uh, interesting to add into our portfolio. So I would guess at the moment, um, most of our focus is on overactive bladder and Alzheimer's, a little bit setting out on gastroparesis, uh, and the rest of our time is really focused on how can we bring new things into our portfolio. Because uh, again, just because the last thing failed doesn't mean the next thing works. So we, our job is to keep bringing things in the portfolio so that we can thrive irrespective of how many things fail along the way. Because most things fail. Sorry, can I ask the question? Yeah. Yeah, we, we had decided before the schizophrenia program read out, our strategy was to really stick focused on the nicotine receptors. Um, and to a large extent, that's still the case. Uh, although at some point, again, we have to build a company that can tolerate the risks of failure. So at some point, we ask ourselves the question, is there something about nicotinics which maybe is just too difficult? Um, so right now, we're looking at bringing in new opportunities that would have a different mechanism so that we offset some of that risk, so we broaden our, our platform a little bit. So we're very open to the idea of pursuing non-nicotinic programs, uh, and we're taking a look at that right now. Yeah, I, 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 if you look at the big picture, I think the opportunity, the opportunity in healthcare, in biotechnology, in biopharmaceuticals, uh, I, I think can only be positive. I mean, there's, there's always going to be a need for um, biotechnology expertise. Uh, as I say, I mean, for every company that struggles along for a period of time, there's one somewhere that's growing like crazy. Uh, the challenge is that a lot of that is in Boston, San Francisco, San Diego. Um, it's tough to catch up with those guys, I think. Uh, but for people who, who are entrepreneurial, who want to start something here, there's plenty of opportunities. For people who want to go to a more stable organization and you prepare to move, there's plenty of those. Um, so as an individual, uh, I, I think biotechnology is a fantastic place to be. If that's something you're passionate about, there will be jobs. Um, I, I, I could be pretty confident that uh, you know, if you're going to choose something, there will be biotechnology jobs 10, 20, 30, 40 years from, 40 years from now. Steve, um, one thing I noticed in the data, I, you know, I'm an old uh, CEO from a biopharmaceutical company and long-time uh, clinical developer at, at Glaxo. Um, I saw the data from Cardiset and I thought it was remarkable, the safety of the compound. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's right. I mean, we now, the most typical cause of a very safe compound is that it's acting like a placebo. Um, so that, that's the downside. Now, I think when we looked at our schizophrenia data, I mean, the compound was very safe, but there were some signals it was having some activity in those patients, but, but clearly not enough to be clinically meaningful. So again, one of the things I didn't put up there as a, as a risk of failure is that you may find something that's biologically active, it's just not sufficiently so to make a difference to a patient. So again, if you take the overactive bladder, if you go to the bathroom 13 times a day, which is you know, 100 times a week, and you find a drug that reduces that to 99, it doesn't matter how statistically significant that is, it's not meaningful, it's not clinically meaningful to the patient. So, but having, you know, just, just following up on that, I think the, the biologists and chemists at Target have done a fantastic job of understanding the specifics of the pathways to try and design drugs that are highly safe 
that target a particular receptor. And, and, and I'm, I'm prolonging this answer just for two more minutes, or one more minute maybe. Nicotine receptors aren't single homogeneous structures. And that's one of the things that we've learned in Targaset, which is it's not like having one lock and nicotine is the one key. It turns out that each nicotine receptor is actually, it's like a barrel. It's like the staves of a barrel with five different staves. And those five staves can all be different. So there's like an alpha-3, beta-4, or a beta-3, alpha-2, or an alpha-7. So there are probably 20 different subtypes of nicotine receptor, all slightly different shapes, all of which need a slightly different key, but which are involved in different diseases. So alpha-7 seems to be involved in brain disease. Alpha-3 seems to be involved more in bladder disease. So part of what we've done in Targaset is to understand those pathways and those receptors and design compounds which only act on the receptor subtype. That gives you the safety profile. So if you can do that, you get the benefit on the thing you want to hit without all those side effects by hitting the other targets that you don't want to hit. Any other questions? Yeah, I, th I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, I think uh, if you look just next week, I'm part of the steering committee for the uh, Life Sciences, the CED conference, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll may as well advertise while I'm here, which is taking place Tuesday, when, uh, Tuesday when? Wednesday, Thursday next week, two days next week anyway. Um, and that's the, the North Carolina Life Sciences annual meeting, um, which we have managed to attract Peggy Hamburg from the FDA, uh, Mike Astro is a good old friend of mine who is the guy who's been signing your social security statements each year as commissioner of social security, who started off uh, as a lawyer and then worked in the biotech industry for many years. Uh, so he's coming to speak on his uh, view of, of biotech and healthcare over the next 10 years or so. Uh, we have George Skangos, who's the CEO of uh, Biogen. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I would say also Clayton Christensen, who's from Harvard University, has written some amazing books on innovation, including The Innovator's Prescription, about changes to the healthcare system over the next uh, several decades. So these are world-class individuals who are coming to North Carolina to speak at our annual conference, which is the conference for North Carolina Biotech, which we work together to put together. So I, I, I think the answer to your question is absolutely. There's a lot of collaboration amongst the folks in, in this region. Yeah. Dr. Hill, you referenced the drugs that are currently being used to treat or try to provide some relief with um, Alzheimer's like Aricept and mm -hmm. Namenda. How, how do those drugs... Uh, you said they're actually not very effective, or could you just reference how those drugs do affect patients? Yeah, the, I think these, they're clearly effective, but the effect is modest um, but meaningful, which is why the drugs are successful in the marketplace. I think the best way I've heard it described to me is that, take Aricept for something, it shifts most patients by about six months. So it, it improves, the, it, it helps them be as good as they would have been for another six months. So it delays the deterioration of disease. The, what we re, the holy grail in Alzheimer's is to find something that actually takes a person and improves them from their, their baseline level. Nothing has been shown to do that to date. So what these drugs do is they slow the rate of deterioration so that you're six months better off than you would have been if you hadn't taken the drug. I hope that's a simplistic answer. Okay, thank you. Steve, uh, before you go. Uh, on behalf of the college and uh, on behalf of our team, the SciTech team and BioNetwork and National Center, we want to thank you very much for presenting today. I promised everybody it would be a very interactive and dynamic lecture. You've come through again, so I want to thank you very much. And so we've got a couple things here for you. One of these is a really interesting little square that has your name and your degrees on it. And uh, it's actually printed here uh, at Foresight Tech. We oh, have that see. technology. And as if you needed another degree, because you have plenty, and you've done very well, we have a nice frame certificate here from our president oh, and myself. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.